I know you've spent countless hours staring at your refrigerator, not wondering what you want to eat, but wondering how does that dang thing work? Well, today you are going to find out. Essentially, your refrigerator, as well as your air conditioner, and a device known as a heat pump, you might not have heard of those, but I'll tell you a bit about them anyway. They all work like a heat engine that we looked at last time, but in reverse. If you remember the heat engine, you had to have some high temperature source, and you had your heat coming in this way. Some of it went out to usable work, and some of it was exhausted to the cold temperature region. And we needed this temperature difference here to get the heat flowing in the first place, and we're able to divert some of it. Well, with the heat engine, essentially, I'm sorry, with the heat pumps, with air conditioners and refrigerators, we're reversing all of those arrows. So we get heat flowing from cold to hot. Yes, you heard that right. Heat can flow from cold to hot. Um, and the only way that can happen is if we have some other device forcing it to do that. It's not going to spontaneously flow from cold to hot. But if we put the right type of work in, we can get that to happen. So heat engines running in reverse. And this can be useful for, obviously, these applications up here. Let me show you some more details here. So your refrigerator, most of this stuff uh, is all covered up now, so you can't see it. But if, uh, if you've ever seen an old refrigerator in somebody's garage or something, a lot of times they used to have these coils exposed on the back. I actually have an old freezer I bought that still has these on it. Uh, today, usually they're on the bottom of the refrigerator and nice and hidden so that you can't see these ugly coils. But here's how it works. You have a pump, and if you ever hear your refrigerator kind of start humming, that's this pump kicking on. It's not on all the time. They kind of cycle on and off. And so usually these pumps are electric. Um, don't think I've ever seen one that runs on anything but electricity, but I guess in theory you could have some other... Um, energy source. Okay, so this pump is going to compress a gas through these coils and usually there's fins just like that heat sink problem we had to increase surface area to increase the uh, the heat flow. So when you compress a gas it gets hot. So what you do is you compress this and then you wait a while for the heat to flow out and now you have a compressed gas that's not so hot anymore and when you open up a valve here originally this was closed so you weren't affecting these coils here that are on the inside of the refrigerator so we compress it let it that gets it hot then we let it cool and then we let it expand and when that gas expands it gets even colder if we compressed it and let it expand immediately it would just go back to the room temperature but by compressing it letting it cool and then letting it expand now we get cold temperature gas and that cold gas in the coils can absorb heat from the inside of the refrigerator. So that's what we're talking about. By the low temperature region, we can actually take heat out from the lower temperature region. The inside of your refrigerator is typically colder than the outside, but by doing this, <clears throat> getting these this cool gas in the coil, it's even colder than the inside of your refrigerator, so you're able to absorb some heat there. And then you can just run this back in, compress it again, and do the whole thing over again. Now, we had to wait for these uh, hot coils here to cool off. So we have heat going out of the back of your fridge, or like I mentioned nowadays, goes out the bottom of your fridge. Um, but all we have to do is input some energy here, and through that process we can move heat from a cold region to a hotter region. Pretty amazing. Okay, now let's look at uh, some of the equations that will apply. Uh, by the way, air conditioners are pretty much an identical process, only you've got these coils. If you've ever noticed, the air conditioners have to be in windows, or sometimes they'll be on top of a, a roof or outside of a building. There has to be something, some component of that air conditioner outside. Now these coils might run a long way with an air conditioner uh, all the way inside the building where there's a fan that will blow over it and force it through the, the air duct. But these hot coils have to be outside. If they're not, 
look at QH compared to QL. QH is bigger because not only is it the energy that you absorbed from the cold area, but it's also the input energy that you put in here. So the overall effect of, the, of a refrigerator is to heat up your kitchen, even if you open the front door. I know some people, when it's hot outside, they're like, oh, open your fridge, it'll cool off your kitchen. No, actually, that's going to make it work harder, and even though it might cool off your face if you stick it in the fridge, overall, there's more heat coming out the back than is being absorbed. Uh, on the interior of your fridge so that would heat up your fridge. So same thing with an air conditioner. You have to have something outside where the hot coils are otherwise you're going to be producing more heat in your house than you're absorbing through the cold coils. Um, <clears throat> in fact I had a little story that goes along with that. When I was in high school uh, before I studied any physics and became the physics master that I am today uh, we were we were taking some girls to a prom and we decided that we were going to have a little pre-prom party in a uh, a U-Haul van. We decked it out with all kinds of decorations, disco ball, sounds kind of lame, but it was pretty cool, let me tell you. Our dates were impressed. But it was like uh, June and it was really hot and so my mom had a air conditioning unit in her window. So I'm like, oh, let's throw that in the back of the truck to cool it off back here and I remember thinking we let that thing run for an hour and I'm like man it is not cooling it off at all in here and little did I know it was actually adding to the heat so study your physics it you never know when it'll come in handy okay to the equations I said we were going to look at a little while ago so same picture here uh, this applies to refrigerators and air conditioners we still have this equation QH equals W minus QL. So that's just a statement of conservation of energy. Before we said the QH coming in equals the W plus the QL. We reverse all these arrows. Essentially we have negative signs on everything, but those can just cancel out, right? So we can uh, miss there. We can leave our equation unchanged because it's still true. Uh, either way, the heat is flowing. You still have these two totaling that. All right, now, before we define efficiency of a heat engine as the work you got out over the price you had to pay to get that work out, which was the heat flowing in. In this case, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier this was kind of benefit over cost. Well, the benefit is a little bit different for a refrigerator or an air conditioner. The benefit is how much heat you get rid of in the cold region. So our benefit, which always goes on top, is QL now, and the cost is how much energy we have to use by plugging in our refrigerator or air conditioner. So there is benefit over cost. Now if you notice, <clears throat> we don't know about the relative sizes of these. Here our efficiency was always going to be uh, less than one, and so our efficiency could be a percentage. In this case, uh, you can have more QL than W, and so this could come out to be greater than 1, so we don't like to call it an efficiency because we don't like to think of this as a percentage. It's just, um, it's just a number that's useful to calculate. So COP stands for coefficient of performance. Coefficient of performance. Performance. It is um, still a way to kind of gauge cost-benefit analysis, but it's not a percentage, so we give it a different name. And like we did before, we can substitute in for W, we can have QH minus QL, so we can rewrite this in different forms depending on what information we're given and what's going to be easiest. And you can apply the same ideas as we did with the Carnot efficiency to find an ideal coefficient of performance for a refrigerator or air conditioner where we once again replace all of our cues, all of our heat flows, with just the temperatures. So you can find if you want your refrigerator to be so cold inside and your kitchen is generally this hot, there is a maximum ideal uh, performance for that refrigerator. Okay, <clears throat> now I also mentioned that other device called a heat pump and the way they work in the same way, but here we're going to redefine our cost benefit little equation because, in this way, it's like you take a refrigerator 
and you stick the back end where the coils are in your house and you open up the front end to the outside and so even though it can be really cold outside you got frosty the snowman over here you can as long as you get those coils even colder you know if it's zero degrees celsius if you get it negative ten on your coils you will still absorb heat from that zero degrees uh, celsius outside and so this is pretty awesome because you could have like a 500 watt uh, input here that's the amount of energy you're using and the amount of heat you will add the QL so you could get a thousand watts or 1200 watts coming out here theoretically this could happen right if that's 500 watts and this is going to be 700 watts uh, so you can get more out than what you're going to have to pay your electric bill for and uh, so these are pretty amazing uh, the one kind of downside to these heat pumps is they they tend to function more slowly because you have to wait for the heat to be absorbed from the outside and um, <clears throat> if it's real cold outside that might be really slow unless you get this QL really really cold um, so these tend to I actually haven't seen a heat pump uh, used instead of a heater I have seen them used for like um, what are they called? Water heaters, where it, it usually heats up the water real slowly. So overnight, you might have a, a heat exchanger that's designed like this that will slowly heat it, and it's incredibly efficient. But if you've got a bunch of people showering and the dishwasher going and everything in the morning, it's not going to be able to go fast enough to keep up with that. So usually they have some kind of hybrid system where they have the old-fashioned flame torch thing to, to heat it up quickly if you need that. But then if you don't need it quickly, it uses the heat pump technology to be much more efficient. Uh, okay, so our, to our equation here, the benefit we want now is not how much QL we have, even though that is good. The overall benefit we want is how much heat that we're putting into our house or into our water heater in the example I just gave. The cost is still the work, and this is basically how many watts it costs to run this device. And again, we can substitute in and get an equation that looks like this, and we can also get an ideal efficiency. So I'll do some examples of these uh, types of calculations coming right up.